Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to teach you my procedure on how to successfully walk students in the hall. But before we get started, here's a great line for you. I'll do algebra, I'll do trig, and I'll even do statistics. But graphing is where I draw the line. <laughs> Teaching procedures right the first time is so important because by the time you have taught your first routine of the year, the students will know you a lot better, and they'll have a fairly clear notion of the standards by which you judge work to be acceptable. One of the very first tests that students will give you is not inside, but out of the classroom, passing through the halls quietly. This is an opportunity for students to see how far they can push the boundaries and how quickly you will push back. Imagine that you're teaching on the first day of school. Today, you'll take the class to the library to meet the librarian. But before the class can get to the library, they must pass through the hall. How do you imagine you would teach this procedure? Well, here's how I do it. First, we set the stage by talking about how noise in the halls prevents students in other rooms from learning. You know the tune. You might say something like, Hallways are for walking, not talking. Next, before you go out into the hall, you must develop visual cues so you can pantomime instructions to the students once you leave the room. A finger to the lips or a zippering of the mouth is standard fare. You also need a stop and start signals. But one signal you must have is the signal to stop, go back, and start all over. You probably remember it. The teacher turns, holds both palms towards the student, and then, with a circular motion, points both index fingers back to the classroom. Yeah, I dreaded this one too. Next, you'll have the students line up. Now it's important to remember that you need to assign places in the line for the same reason that you assign seating. Place the better students who disrupt right under your nose at the front of the line and place the orderly students at the back of the line. This will ensure that the back never gets too far away and that the middle stays where they should be. Double lines are always better than single lines. They're more compact and easier to manage. Additionally, a lot of teachers put students into boy and girl lines. I like to do something different. I alternate boy-girl, boy-girl, boy-girl in each line. This ensures that every boy student has a girl to the front, to the back, and to the side. Once you're lined up, but before going out into the hall, you'll need to rehearse each of your signals one last time to be sure that you can direct the students with nonverbal cues. Only then are they ready. After everyone has zipped their lips and you've gone out into the hall, with due seriousness, you check the lines for straightness and quietness before you give the signal to follow me. Pop quiz. What do you think the odds are that a group of brand new students make it all the way to the library in complete silence on the first try? If your guess was zero, give yourself a gold star. What happens? Halfway down the hall, you hear a giggle from somewhere in the group. Do you care who giggled? No. Do you care how loud it was? No. Do you care whether students in nearby classroom were actually put off task? No. The sound, the volume, the distraction are not what is important. Your reaction is. You turn, hold palms towards the class, make the circular motion with your hands, and point back to the classroom and then brace yourself. You're going to get some pained looks on those little faces. Some show disbelief for a moment before they realize that you're not kidding. Your keeping a straight face is probably the hardest part of the routine. You might feel a little bit bad or even want to giggle, crack a smile, or feel bad for them. Don't. Once the class shuffles back to where they began, repeat your signals. Straight lines, Zippered lips, follow me. Off we go again. Each time down the hallway, 
you'll find yourself doing a little better. Now imagine this time the class makes it two-thirds of the way to the library when you hear someone talking at the back of the line. Do you care who talked? No. Do you care how loud it was? No. You turn, hold palms towards the class, and give them your now well-known about-face signal. This time, you see serious pain on the students' faces. Several students mouth the words, I didn't do it, with pleading hands and lots of exaggerated sincerity. Keep a straight face. Back to the beginning. Line straight. Lips zipped. Follow me. Off they go once again. This time, they almost make it to the library when you hear someone whispering from behind. You know what to do by now, don't you? Turn, palms to signal stop, and then about face. So close, yet so far. The pain registered on faces the third time around is almost too much to bear. Bite your lip. Old pros know that this is the only way to play the game and win. Practicing until mastery is achieved. This is teaching. Through simple practice to mastery, you're signaling to the students by your investment of time and energy that this piece of behavior is important. You're not just telling them, you're showing them, I say what I mean and I mean what I say. And we are going to keep doing this until we get it right. So here's how it works. You practice, and you practice, and you practice. You keep doing it until you get it right. Practice to mastery. As you practice, 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 a transformation occurs within the group. Because it's only through training such as this that students learn to take you seriously. They learn that when you say something, they need to listen.